2 Timothy 14 through 17. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed. You know those who taught you, and you know that from infancy you, you have known the sacred scriptures, which are able to give you wisdom for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Good morning, Inspire family, and welcome to the podcast, The Follow-Up. I'm joined here with Pastor Randy and Pastor Ernie. Hey, everybody. Good morning. Welcome. All right, yesterday we talked about the parable of the landowner and the bad tenants found in Matthew chapter 21, verses 33 through 46. Can you give us a, a quick rundown of what, what that sermon was? Well, I'll tell you what, I, I, uh, there are several ways we can, we can look at this scripture, and it's obvious when the Bible says in 2 Timothy that all scripture is given, and then it gives us four or five things that it can do for us. Um, I took a particular take on it. It had to do with, with stewardship and God's abundance in our lives and the fact that God is owning every everything mm-hmm. in this. And I think I started out with three trips through this parable. We actually, uh, to show the people that it could be taken several ways, that could it just be taken for, you know, its face value as a good story that we could tell each other and it's got a moral and we should learn something from it or was it directed at a specific audience for that day and how could those uh, how could the, the overtones of this actually touch us today is the scripture for us today and how does it apply to us so that's kind of the angle that I yeah. took on it well you know I, I loved there's something I caught there um, during your sermon it was like this surprise of the scripture that like you can read it a thousand times and you come in and there's this novelty of it no matter what still we all got to realize that through life we're going through transitions and the onion begins to peel and as a layer comes off of that onion uh, we open up for more learning Mm -hmm. the bible doesn't just take us down the road farther it takes us deeper is, is what happens and and as we learn and we grow and we become more wise then obviously the scripture it doesn't change, but it takes on deeper meaning because the Holy Spirit applies it to our life. What do you think sure. about that, yeah. Ryan? Yeah, I liked a lot um, your allusion to the Jewish, uh, sort of the Jewish anecdote about Scripture being like a jewel, and it reflects and refracts light differently depending on how you hold it. Yeah. And Scripture is absolutely that way. And so life will do that. And, and this, the same scripture that we got lesson A out of 10 years yes. ago in our life will all of a sudden give us an entirely new lesson B because we're in a different time and space in our life, which is why sometimes people will ask me, and they, maybe they've asked you this, Ernie, you know, Pastor Randy, do you ever just redo an old sermon that you've done? <laughs> um, and here's what I will plead guilty to. <laughs> I've definitely reused illustrations, which... Uh, I probably should quit doing that. Um, but uh, but I've never, ever, ever taken an old sermon and just reconstituted it and used it because the time and place and audience is different and the Spirit needs to speak differently to that audience in this time and place. And so that's our job is to is to take, you know, a text like this, for example, uh, which maybe I've preached on five times or something over the course of my career and say, okay, given for Inspire, or in your case, like Inspire, at this time, at this place, uh, what is it, Holy Spirit, Mm -hmm. that you want our people to learn and to hear? Um, That's what we call homiletics in in preaching class. And and to ask that question, to pray through that question and prepare through that question. And and there's a certain intuitiveness that goes with that. Uh, And so... Uh, I think you see that for sure, and, uh, and yet, Randy, you know, you've been shocked, and I've been shocked, at the end of at the end of sermons because I would sit in my office and I would study and and prepare myself, and I'd say, now here's what I want these sheep to get, and I would show up and I would deliver this and feel really, really, really good about it, and then as people began to talk to me about it, 
they got something completely yeah. different than I thought I was going to give right. them. That absolutely right. happens. And diverse yeah. across the... And this is why you'll hear me at the beginning of my sermons invite the Holy Spirit to come be yes. the teacher and to teach us each what we need to hear because only the Spirit knows what we each need to learn in that situation. There's great freedom in being a preacher and doing that, giving the control of the lesson, in essence, over to the Holy Spirit. I know. Mm -hmm. All we do is do what you said, Ernie, which is as faithfully as we can, Yeah. Um, which includes the homework and all that, rightly divide the Word of God as best as we can. Yes. And, and, and then be okay with however the Spirit wants to take that and run with that in any particular person's mind or heart. And by the way, this is a very old thought. Because remember, our, our Jewish leaders, the teachers of the law, they would get together in, in their circles and begin, is it called midrashing? They would literally argue over the tenets of any particular scripture because one would say this, and the other one would say, hey, I agree with two points you said there, but I'm going to add to that. Yeah. And this guy would say, no, I don't agree. And what they were doing is taking the scripture and trying to rightly divide that. When you think of that, Sage, does it intimidate you that that uh, scripture could seemingly change over the years, or is it something that comforts you? Well, yeah. I mean, even just to talk to that whole situation, uh -huh. um, I've been leading a Bible study for over a year now for young adults, and it's it's crazy how each person gets something different, and it could be you know it could be so good. I think that there is something really special that the Holy Spirit does um, when you read a text, when you read a scripture, and that yes, I've I've been it's there's been certain scriptures I'm like oh I know exactly what this means right, and then the Holy Spirit's like no well, maybe not you know maybe it's actually this and my first inclination is to be a little like standoffish maybe a little bit like that, but I think that it has worked in my life in this way. And in this way, you know, it's not that I need to get rid of all that I was taught through it on one understanding of the scripture and then just adopt this brand new one, but to put those two together and say, oh, wow, this, I mean, this means so much. I, I, ahead, I was just going to say, and I, don't th I don't think it's that the scriptures change. I think it's nope. that our, our experience around nope. those scriptures change. Nope. And we, we start to see things that were already there or always there. We just start to see them. Yeah. And, and so, you know, there's different styles of preaching even. You know, you go back to the early church, the dominant way of preaching and teaching the scriptures was called the allegorical method. So they would look at scripture and they would apply this very metaphoric or allegorical way. Um, and boy, some of the early church fathers, as much as I admire them, they would run into some pretty weird places with yeah. that. And so I think there's a weakness to that method where you, you can overinterpret. Um, they talk about in seminary, never be guilty of eisegesis. And, and here's what they mean by that. The word mm -hmm. eis in Greek means into. And so they said, never be guilty of reading into the scripture, your own biases, as much yeah. as possible. I mean, yeah. we're obviously going to be biased to some degree, but as much as possible. In other words, and, and so they would say, no, be be faithful exegesis exegetes meaning pull out what's there yes yep. show what's there don't read into and i think that the the danger of a, of this allegorical method is is that you you very easily start reading into things uh, mm -hmm. in ways that maybe aren't really there and and so then the the method i tend to use is what's called the historical critical kind of approach uh, to really look at the scripture and say okay what when where why how who Yes. Those are the questions. Who was he talking to? Why was he talking to him? What was going on? Historically, what was the setting? Those kinds of things. And then to say, okay, now given those things, we get a better, clearer understanding probably of what was motivating what was oh, behind true. this. Yep. And, and oftentimes it will dramatically shift our understanding of what's actually the Absolutely. text is saying. Absolutely. Because we say, oh, this is what he was saying and who he was saying to and why. Now I kind of get this. Uh, there's, there's weaknesses to that approach, mm -hmm. though, too, in, the, in that it can sometimes lack personal heart and personal approach. Yeah. So, so I don't, I'm not advocating that one approach is better than the other. 
um, but they both have their strengths and their and their weaknesses. Obviously, I grew up in in America. I, I'm a child of the Western mm -hmm. kind of thinking, and uh, realized that Eastern thinking <laughs> is a whole lot different than than Western. And and obviously, I sat under preachers as I grew up who taught the word, and it would be more in a literal sense because we like our our bullet points and. We like to learn scripture and be done with that, and mm. we know what that means, and it makes us feel a little safer, it feels. But you know what? A few years ago when I started listening to a guy like, like Ray Vanderlaan, and he began to talk about the culture, the culture, and then he would read scripture through the lens of the culture that Jesus lived right. in. Right, right. The scripture began to really come alive yeah. to me, and I then knew that I... I didn't know very much about about some of that. I'm and, reading a book yeah. right now yeah. uh, that I ordered. Uh, it's called The New Testament in Its Setting by uh, scholar uh, N.T. Wright. Yep. It's Ooh. it's uh, 900 pages, and my wife looks at me and is like, "Why? Do you, how could you possibly?" It's a textbook. Yeah. Yeah. That's and for it's very like, sick right, people. That will right, read exactly. <laughs> They'll read novels. Exactly. Too. That you, you know, you were supposed to be done with that kind of stuff when you were done with right. seminary. But but if it has more than a hundred pages, I'm not in. <laughs> but I think it's really helpful. I don't yeah. think we can ever not stop learning about yeah. those things, those cultural things, yes. and 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 those historical things. Um, because I think it helps us to rightly divide the word better and more yeah. accurately, um, and and hopefully more fruitfully too. So you go back right. to this this parable, and you know, Ernie, you did a nice job of talking about uh, most of Jesus' parables, or at least a lot of them were they were agrarian, they were agriculture, yes, because yeah. that's what people understood, and that was sort of their lives. And so, as a master teacher, he he taps into what they're familiar points of their lives are yes, yes. and he uses this in, interesting thing and you take the stewardship angle and then of course there's a second refraction to this a second level to this which is um that he's speaking to the pharisees the teachers of the law the yeah. sadducees yep. and and so he's really we call this a polemic he's he's rebuking these Leaders and they cannot stand it. They, no. they, their, their, their reaction is visceral. They want to kill them, even though the parable itself yeah. prophetically says exactly. you're going to kill the exactly. one that that the master sends. Yep. And then he uses, of course, the stone uh, that the builders rejected. Uh, uh, quote from the Old Testament as well, as if to emphasize it even more, which is fascinating. So, so then you have a stewardship element of this in terms of, uh, okay, if, if we're stewarding these blessings of God, you can go that direction, which Ernie did. The other direction that you can take is, okay, if, if the Pharisees and the Sadducees lesson was um, because of our selfishness, because of our need for power and control, we don't recognize the Messiah when he comes, mm -hmm. which is really what Jesus is saying. Right. Hey, the Messiah is right here in yep. front of you, and you won't recognize him. Yep. Um, how does that apply to us today in light of the second coming? Oh. Hmm. Because he's going to return, right? So how do, and, and so this is actually related to our discussion yeah. we had before yep. we clicked on here, which was in light of the second coming, how do we not be guilty of the same thing? Boy. How, right? How do we recognize him? How are we humble enough to understand that, 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 that the master, the Lord, is sending the son again? Mm -hmm. Jesus himself said he's going to return. And people get caught up thinking, well, that means I have to figure out all the little details of prophecy so I can recognize him. And, and, and I think that is a dangerous rabbit trail. Mm -hmm. you know, because the issue for the stewards in this parable was it those kinds of details? The issue was their heart. Yeah. That yeah. was the issue, their heart. Right. They had become um, self-appointed owners of something they didn't own. Yes. They had become, uh, they had decided that power and control was more important to them than yeah. actually what God was doing and going to do. And so we have to ask ourselves that when Jesus returns, what's the state of our heart going to be? 
Are we going to, are our hearts going to be so attuned to him in, in not just our knowledge of scripture, which I think is, you know, the love of the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind part, mm -hmm. but also in our application of it in loving our neighbor. Mm -hmm. Both are critical and both need to be held in balance and tension in our lives. It, it, because if we don't, our hearts will not hear the voice of our shepherd. Right. Absolutely. They yep. won't hear it. And, and we'll be easily fooled. Easily fooled to one degree or another. If, if we don't learn the scriptures, we'll be prey to false messiahs. Yep. Yeah. Because we'll just decide that I love my neighbor and we'll decide that love, we'll decide, you know, we'll define what love is. Mm -hmm. And we've seen in the world now what a mess that is. Yep. Right? If there is a critique of our modern American culture today, it's that we decide, we've, we've decided that we can decide anything we want about anything. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be a 60, I don't want to be a 53-year-old man anymore. I'm going to be a 72-year-old woman for whatever reasons yeah. I want, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's, it's gotten to the point of insanity, of craziness. Like truth is on a sliding scale. C.S. Lewis actually predicted yeah. this, believe it or not. Yeah. In some of his writings uh, 60 years ago, he actually predicted this stuff. So, so this is fascinating stuff. What is the state of our heart? And I think that is, that might be the deepest jewel of this, of this uh, particular parable. Sure, is is that part right there of that the state of their hearts were in such a way that they may not have recognized the Messiah for who he was, but even if they did, they didn't care anymore. Yeah. Yep. And boy, who wants to be guilty of those two things? I know. Yeah. Right. And, and that's, that's a valid question for us to really wrestle with, is when he returns, will our hearts be prepared to recognize and receive him? Mm -hmm. Well, so then you back up to the sermon itself, and I think it backs up what you're talking about, just that very first takeaway that says, we need to live cognizant of the fact that God owns everything. Did that? Yeah, well, what did you think of that? I mean, I, I and those two yeah. things, Ernie, are tied together. They are tied together. I love your quote here. It said, you said, in the beginning, the people created the heavens and the earth. Yeah. The people created God in their own image. That's how we is live. That, is that true? Is that correct? That's it. <laughs> you take the Pharisees, right there, the people. Did they believe that God gave them that, that word and it actually belonged to them to be able to decide and to decipher and to put burdens on people with. And maybe that's the trouble, is we take ownership to such a place that we believe now that we own this and we forget the fact that it's God who breathed it into existence. And when this is all said and done, he owns everything in the material world and everything in the spiritual world and we just borrow it for a time. So let me share something fascinating. I really love that quote because because this is the sin of the garden. Yeah. Really? Did God say that? Yes. Really? You can be like God, by the way. In other words, you can start to create God in your image, not the other way around. Um, so at, at Sage's suggestion, I've been listening while I'm on my treadmill, you know, um, to these uh, podcasts, Socrates in the City, with mm -hmm. uh, Eric Metaxas. And, and a lot of the early interviews, these are about an hour long, and a lot of the early interviews are him talking with guys like um, Oxford mathematician John Lennox oh, and, yes. uh, and uh, oh. Stephen Meyer, who's uh, kind of the head of the intelligent design movement yes. when Discovery it comes to Institute. creation and yep. stuff. Yes. And uh, uh, Michael Behe I listened to yesterday, another, uh, another Cambridge, I think it is, um, uh, really scientist, guy. right? <laughs> and they're talking. And so here's the fascinating part, and this is totally relevant to this quote you did, Ernie, is – Increasingly, in especially the biological sciences, we are beginning to realize and see that the idea that everything started up randomly by an accident is impossible. Impossible. Mm -hmm. It's mathematically impossible. There's not been enough time throughout in, in the history of the ages to do it. Nope. Um, and the complexity of the human DNA, and the, we have to remember human DNA isn't just a bunch of proteins and protoplasm. Human DNA is a code. It's like a book, yes. and yep. it's like a gigantic volume book yep. um, Very that's unique to everybody, right? And, and so they're realizing, and, and so the, the conclusion is, is that 
the more we actually pay attention to the scientific method, the more it's steering us back to there's a mind behind yeah. all of this. Yep. There's a mind behind. And, and, and here's the fascinating part is all of these uh, people that uh, Eric is interviewing, they're all top-notch scientists. Oh, yeah. Nobel well people. respected. Right? And they're saying, and yet two-thirds of the people in our discipline, no matter where the evidence leads them, refuses yes. to acknowledge it. It's right here. They refuse to acknowledge it. And they, in other words, they're not interested, actually, in the facts. They have an agenda, and that agenda is no God, or, Which blows or God in the, my own image. Yes, it just totally blows by even the scientific method. It said if, if you if you discover new truth, you go with the new truth. It proves it's a spiritual thing yes. that they sit on that even though new evidence is coming out all the time. So here's the <laughs> ironic thing is, is, is if you go back to some of the earlier philosophers back in the 16, 17, 1800s, Voltaire was one of them. And Voltaire, he's not exactly what we would say is a Christian philosopher at all. He was a self-avowed atheist, this French guy. Part of the French Revolution, not exactly a Christian movement either. Yeah. <laughs> um, Voltaire basically acknowledges, he, he says, the reason I don't believe in God isn't because of the evidences. The reason I don't believe in God is because I don't want to believe in God. I don't <laughs> want telling, there to be a God. I want, I want to live life on my own terms. There it is. I, in other words, I want to make God in my image. Yeah. And he was dead honest about it. Dead honest about it. And, and we're starting to see this happen in, in those sciences. So, so I pray for our scientists that they would begin, that there would be a softening of hearts in the scientific mm -hmm. community to see where some of this has, has gone. You talk about abortion and Roe v. Wade. Uh, actually, within the language of Roe v. Wade, as much as we may not like that law, Justice Blackman says that basically if it can be shown that human life, that it is human life during these early stages, then we have to reinterpret. It's, it says it in the very yeah. law. Wow. And, Interesting. And so people, it's so funny because people, for example, on the political left will look at the people on the political right and say, you're anti-science. You're anti-science because they're talking about climate change or something. And yet the science very clearly, very clearly has shown that that blob of Tissue that was described as a fetus back in Blackman's day when Roe v. Wade came about is, in fact, not a blob of tissue. There's real yeah. life. There's real development happening there. This is a yeah. human being. You need one cell in order to right. have the DNA code, which right. is very complex to right. create. And yet, what does this movement say? Well, the movement is, we don't care. We don't care. Because why? Because they want it their way. Yeah. That's yeah. just the honest truth. And, and this this seems like a real wide rabbit trail around this parable, but it's not. It's all tied into what is the state of our hearts as stewards and as people awaiting the second coming of the Master's Messiah. Yeah. Yes. Well, and the, and the people say, well, the the Master in this in this parable says, well, I'll send my son. They say, we'll get rid of the son because mm -hmm. we want the inheritance, right? Mm -hmm. We want to be in charge of get this place, of right? If we get rid of him, then we're free. You know, right? And that's just completely wrong. I mean, that's exactly what we're doing here. Well, and right? in an irony, you know, they get what they want, but what they want turns out to be hell. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And that's that's what happens. Is is you know, God doesn't throw people into hell. People choose it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And 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 they choose a bad bargain. Right. It's C.S. Lewis's quote. There's those that say to God, "Thy will be done." Yep. Look up to Him and say. You know, your will for my life, and those who God will say yep. to them, that will be done. Yep. Man. Yep. And well, and he said this about hell. He said, the doors of hell are locked from the inside. Yep. Yeah. That's actually, if I can interject with, um, we, in our class, the Sunday class I teach, we were looking at um, this story that was told about Lazarus and the rich man. So the rich man in hell and Lazarus, the beggar in heaven. And what's really interesting is the rich man in hell calls out to Abraham and says, send Lazarus just to give me a, a drink of water. He doesn't say, hey, get me out of here. You know, yeah. you know, please just you know, love my people. He says, hey, take that guy and make him serve me again. Yep. 
right? Yes. Yeah. Hey, yes. Go, go take Lazarus and go make him talk to my brothers, you know. This is, again, a great example, Sage, of it's so easy to just gloss over the, the nuances of these stories. Mm -hmm. It's so we, we it's so much more fruitful in our lives if we learn to read scripture more slowly and take it in smaller bite sized chunks and, and really consider the little yeah. things like that because they are quite revealing about things. That's why I love the Tuesday morning and Tuesday night yeah. class too, because we're doing that. We're 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 really unpacking some of the different layers of the onion, so to speak. In, in scripture and some of the different refractions yep. of this jewel yep. on stuff and, and for many people it's like wow I have never heard that yeah. before and they look at me and I can tell mm, I'm feeling a little standoffish about this is this really right is this true you know, yep. that's because they've never been taught this you know in Sunday school or you know maybe their pastor never talked about this or and of course we have a un, un, uh, an unwavering commitment at Inspire to faithful and orthodox interpretation of the scripture. Mm -hmm. You know, people out there, we promise we will never take you somewhere that is even near the edges of heresy. Yeah. We will always be looking to make sure that we are being faithful and true in, in our true. rightly dividing <clears throat> the word of God here. Um, but that doesn't mean that there aren't things within that word that are new teachings and new angles to us. There are, yeah. because if they're not, you guys, then we're just making the word in our own image too. True. Right. God, uh, God inspired people to write this, but it wasn't done then. His creation is not done yet. God did not Good point. finish anything. He continues to show us places of Himself that we haven't known before, that we haven't seen, and I, and I love that. I just I just love that. So if we if we go with this thing that God owns owns everything. Um, we'd be remiss not to say that in this scenario of, you know, uh, this parable, that, that he set them up. He not only created everything, but look what he set up. He set up, he'd already grown the fruit. He'd already set up the wine press. He had already built the tower. Mm -hmm. All they had to do is walk on and just do this and follow the covenant or the tenets of the covenant that he wrote and and to give their whatever percentage to him and they were set they were set for life isn't that kind of how we work everything belongs to us in our lives we become selfish god gave it to me okay it's mine 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 what what do y'all think so, of that so so paul <laughs> stresses that and i think it's in colossians where he's writing to the church there and he has this interesting phrase where he says owning nothing yet i possess everything Ooh. in christ and and i think mm -hmm. that what he's saying there is is that let's let's remember that we're stewards of everything that nothing yeah. is ours it's all god's like you said but in the acknowledge of that they, when we acknowledge that in our lives we actually possess it all we do. Absolutely. It's the it's the joy and the glory of the master of the Lord to do that for us. Is to give that. Think about you as a parent. Isn't that kind of true of the way you parent your kids? Hey, absolutely. Nothing that my kids have, when they live in my house, they own nothing, yeah. and yet they possess everything because I want to love and bless them. Because and if me, kids. who's sinful, does that, right? Says Jesus, yep. how much more our heavenly Father? Remember when this was supposed to be a fifteen-minute podcast, yeah. <laughs> yeah. and now we're at twenty minute, twenty-eight and a half minutes. So, oh yeah. Hey, but listen, Second Peter chapter one says His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life. Everything we need, just like He gave them everything they needed to grow grapes and to to sell the product. It says through these, He's He has given us very great and precious promises, and that through them we may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption of the world caused by evil desires. Then it gives a whole list of things that He gives us. He says goodness and knowledge and self-control and perseverance and godliness and, and mutual affection. And he says, and he gives us love. And then he makes that statement that he gives them all to us, everything we need to produce the fruit. He says, then if you possess these qualities in increasing measure. So he gives us a little bit of all. And whose job is it then 
to study and to learn and to grow. That's the steward part of our There's assignment. There's the steward mm -hmm. part of it. It's the to bring out the back. potential of what's been given. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So so that's a great place I think to to wrap yeah. it up here. I I would a I'd like to ask our listeners. Um, we're learning as we go with this podcast. And so listeners out there, if you have any feedback for us about anything we could do um, or talk about that would be helpful to you, is it too short? Is it too long? Yep. What would be helpful to you? Give us some feedback and just do it right on our Facebook page where we yep. post it. And we would be happy to try and listen to that. And we want this to be something really edifying and something that you Absolutely. as listeners look forward to. And I know when I listen to podcasts, I like them to be right around an hour, actually, because yep. I can do something else while I'm listening to it. But maybe not in this case. I don't know. We want to hear from our listeners on this. Absolutely. Yeah, well, right. thank you, Inspire Family, and God bless you.